What I discovered about these off-grid style rainwater harvesting and filtration systems is definitely going to help you guys out. Now, I've done these uh, installations a couple of times and I still ended up learning some new tips and tricks. And in today's video, I'm going to share that with you guys. I'm going to explain to you each part of the system and how it all works together. We're also going to talk about why the system is designed the way it is compared to the more conventional sort of layouts that you guys might be familiar with. And we're going to talk about the water test results uh, that I've got from after installing the system and then cover a whole lot of common questions. Things like what filter elements go in these housings? What order they go in? Um, why did I use copper pipe instead of multi-layer pipe? Uh, how do we service the system? Why is the UV light mounted upside down? How come these filter housings are some, sometimes uh, very difficult to open? Um, there's probably a whole lot of questions that you guys have that I will cover in this video. So it's going to be jam-packed. Let's get started. This is our off-grid rainwater harvesting and filtration system. And in a previous video, I showed you guys exactly how I installed this entire system. And I also shared with you all of the best tips and tricks. So just before we get started, if you guys are interested, I will leave links in the description to some of the tools that I use to install this complete system, including uh, some of the components like the pumps, uh, pump controllers, filter housings, etc. Whatever information I can find, I will leave it in the description just to make your guys' life a little bit easier. So to start off, this is a 10,000 liter water storage tank and the water flows out of the outlet through a ball valve and then down a 40 millimeter pipe. And then it interconnects to the, another two 10,000 liter water storage tanks that we've got down the way. Um, so all of these are interconnected at the bottom. Then we've got a drain valve or a drain outlet, if you will. This is just another uh, one inch ball valve. It's not pumped this water. So if you open this up, well, I can actually show you, water starts flowing out directly from the tanks. Then if we, if we look at the piping that sort of travels from our water tank, it'll travel up through another ball valve and then it makes a 90 degree turn and then flows into our pump. Now I've also got quick connect couplings over here. The reason being is because uh, I work on these pumps quite often and I like to pop them in and out of the system to check them to see that they're working correctly. So it's up to you. You guys don't have to install quick couplings but it does make things a little bit easier when you need to repair a pump at a later stage. So from the tank, the water comes along through our isolating valve and then into our pressure pump. Now specifically, this is a DAB Jetcom pressure pump. So it pumps up the water, the water comes out the top of the pump through another isolating valve and then through a strainer. This is a mesh strainer, about 200 microns, and then it flows up into our flow controller. So the water ends up flowing from our pressure pump all the way through our pump controller and then up the piping, carries on up here and then it goes into our first sediment filter. Now, this is our first stage of filtration. There's two sediment filters. This first one is a 20 micron sediment filter, and the next one is a one micron sediment filter. So out of that, it goes down the copper pipe, 22 millimeter copper pipe, and then flows through our UV uh, sterilizer. And then I don't know if you guys can actually see this, it's getting a bit tight here, but it goes out the UV sterilizer up that copper pipe, into our second stage of filtration. Now these are our carbon filters. So the first one that we've got over here, this is a granulated carbon filter, and then it goes through that, and then up and out, and then into a carbon block filter. Once the water travels through our carbon block filter, it travels out and down this piece of multi-layer uh, pipe, MLP or PEX pipe, travels down through an isolating valve, so we'll talk about that later, travels down into our main water line and then it goes into our house. So you may have noticed there is a bit of other piping here. Now what is this for? We'll get to that right now. But before we do, I'm using a Davy rain bank flow controller or pump controller. Now I chose this specifically because of its configuration. So we've got a pressure pump pumping water through the flow controller and into the house. But what happens if the, the, the tank over here runs dry or if there's a um, a power failure, then we can still use mains water. So this controller automatically fails over, it takes priority from the tank, but it automatically fa fails back over to our main supply and then pumps that into our house. So what we've got over here, it's a little bit dark down here, but we've got our main water supply line coming in and then it goes up there and it comes across here 
it goes through another ball valve or an isolating valve and then there's some check valves over here uh, backflow prevention valves and then it goes into our controller uh, there is also a little connect down over here so let's just take a quick step back we've got the outlet water from our system that comes down this white pipe and then into our house then we've also got the main water supply line that comes down here it goes up there and then through our pump controller so what I've got over here is just basically a little interconnect so when we need to service this entire system all that we need to do is shut off this valve and shut off this valve so we've isolated the filters in the pump and then we can open up this valve and then we've got our main or our uh, main line water coming straight through and then into the house so you guys uh, can configure this however you want to I've chosen to configure it like this it works pretty well and um, all of the valves are mechanical or manual should I say so there's no relying on um, on check valves spring loaded check valves that can get stuck and believe me guys these things do get stuck they do require maintenance so I've chosen to go with the, the full manual method in this case and the last part of the system is basically your electrical connections. So I've got my supply coming in through some conduiting on the wall, and then it travels up into a, uh, into a waterproof external plug box. So our pump controller and the UV controller are both plugged in in this top plug box. So the pump controller travels out and then through some conduit down the wall and then into our controller. Then we've also got the UV light which is plugged into the top plug box. It loops down into a second uh, water resistant external plug box. Uh, this one is just empty and it's, it's housing or protecting the ballast for the UV tube. And then that travels out and then into the UV tube. So something else to keep in mind when installing these systems. Now, of course, this is going to vary depending on wherever in the world you are and your various regulations. But of course, we've got a water installation here that runs off of electricity. And if you have a quick look, my uh, electrical connection points are over there and my pumping uh, and controller points are over here. So when you need to work on the system, uh, you may be tempted to not turn off the electricity. Now that is a very, very dangerous and a very bad habit. So close to the system, we've got a physical disconnection point where I can open that box, remove the plug from the, uh, from the socket, and then everything here is completely isolated. So this is very good practice and it also applies um, specifically in South Africa to things like electric fences and to gate motors where you've got to have an isolation point uh, within a certain distance of the installation and that's so that um, when you're working on it you can isolate the installation and work on it safely so guys just keep that in mind so looking at it from another angle i've just quickly opened up the boxes for you and you can see here we've got our two uh, outlets one for the controller and one for the uv light they've both got independent switches and they can be completely isolated by actually removing the plug from the outlet then in the lower box we've got the ballast for the uv light and that's in a box just to protect it from, from the weather. So the first part of our filtration system are our two sediment filters. Now the reason we need these two sediment filters is to remove uh, suspended particles in the water and make the water as clean as possible so that the UV light can do its job. Now let's quickly talk about that. Um, for the UV light to kill the bacteria, now technically it's not really killing the bacteria I suppose, it's just um, inactivating the microorganisms basically altering the dna so that it, the bacteria can't reproduce but technicalities aside yeah um, I, I believe that's how it goes uh, we need the water to be as clean as possible so that the uv light the actual rays of the light can come into contact with the little bacteria now bacteria is really really small and if you've got suspended particles that are traveling through your system the bacteria can I suppose a way of uh, explaining it is the bacteria can hide behind these little um, these particles these suspended particles of dirt in the water it's called shading and um, they can be shaded and travel unharmed through the entire UV system and then into the rest of your system so we need to filter out as much sediment and color as possible. 
Um, so we're going to do that with two stages of sediment filtration. The first stage here is a 20 micron uh, sediment filter. And then the next stage, I have installed a one micron sediment filter. Now, you can go uh, up to a five micron. That is also okay, but nothing bigger than a five micron. And generally, uh, I believe the best uh, sort of bang for buck here is going on a scale uh, or a ratio of one to 10. So if you've got a five micron filter, uh, as your last filtration stage, then you go with a 50 micron filter uh, as your first filtration. Or if you've got a 20, you would go with a two, but we don't really, I didn't have a two, so we've gone with a 20 and a one. And that gives you a good balance between um, the different types of filtration that you get from each system. And then it flows down into our UV light so the UV light can do its job. So the second part of our filtration system is the UV sterilization lamp. So the water comes through our uh, sediment filters, then travels through our UVC lamp where it is uh, sterilized, and then it goes out into the rest of the system. Now, the way that this uh, light works is it exposes uh, bacteria in the water to the UVC light. So as it passes through, uh, as I said previously, it kind of uh, deactivates or kills that, BM, uh, that, that uh, bacteria. So the more exposure time you, the bacteria has to the UVC light, the um, sort of the more effective it is at killing the bacteria and the less exposure time, the less effective it is at killing the bacteria. Now, the reason I say that is because I've chosen a 55 watt bulb here. You can see it's quite a large system and that's because I've got many taps connected after the system. Uh, but it's something that you guys really need to take into account. You might think to yourself, well, I don't need something this big. I've only got a small house. But, but something to consider is that the exposure time to UV is very important. So something like this, um, it is, it's rated for about 12 gallons per minute or about 45 liters per minute of flow rate, and it's still effectively killing the bacteria. Now, that might not sound like, uh, well, no, it might sound like too much, but, but hang on. If you're just opening a tap to take a drink of water, geez, you're using like five liters per minute, it's really nothing. So it's well within the capability of this lamp or even a smaller lamp, the really short ones that are like 20 watts. Um, but keep this in mind. Let's say somebody is having a shower, your washing machine is going, so the shower uses maybe 15 liters per minute. The washing machine maybe uses 15 liters per minute. Maybe there's somebody else uh, using another tap somewhere in the house. So all of a sudden you're already using 30 liters per minute. And now you're going to open a tap and expect to drink sterilized water. And if you're using a large enough system, uh, then the water will be sterilized. But if you're using one of those really small systems where maybe the flow rate through it, the recommended flow rate is only like 15 liters per minute, then uh, you've exceeded the capability of the system already and it's not effectively killing the bacteria. So that is something to keep in mind when, um, when you're installing or choosing or sizing your UV light relative to your system. I would say those smaller systems, the, the ones that are sort of uh, 5, 10 or 15 watts that have got the low um, flow rate through them, that can maybe be installed at a single point. So after your UVC system, if you've just got one tap, one drinking tap coming out there, sure, then you can install it then because you're never going to exceed the flow rate or the capability of, um, of the UV light to sterilize the water. But in this case, it's a whole house filtration system. The bigger, the better. So once the water is passed through our UV sterilizer, it flows up and into our last stage of filtration. Now this last stage of filtration, you can see there's two filters here. Both of these are carbon filters. Now these carbon filters remove uh, things like organic material, uh, the bad smell or taste from water, chlorine. Uh, they also remove a little bit heavy metals, not too much, but a little bit. But basically uh, it makes your water a lot more palatable. Um, there's two of them here. In the first stage, we're using a granulated uh, carbon filter. And then in the second stage, we're using a carbon block filter. We're using one of each because each of them have got their own sets of strengths. And uh, we're, using, we're taking advantage of each one's set of strengths. And also something to keep in mind uh, that we've got two carbon filters here. The longer exposure time or the more the water is exposed to the carbon, uh, the more effective the carbon filters are. So the first bit of our carbon filtration that we have here is using a 
granulated carbon filter. Now these granulated carbon filters are really good at filtering out um, bad odors and bad tastes in water. And uh, they've also got a very high flow rate when compared to the carbon block filters. However, they do give off a, a bit of a carbon dust or a couple of particles that travel in through the system. And uh, if those aren't filtered out, you may actually even see it in your water. So in our case, we've uh, after our granulated carbon filter, we've installed a carbon block filter, which uh, filters down to about five microns. Now, the, even though the flow rate isn't as fast as our granulated carbon filter, um, it slows the water down somewhat. And because it does that, it's more effective at removing chlorine from the water or the chlorine taste from the water um, because of the flow rate through it, the water is, is sort of in contact with the carbon a little bit longer. If you don't have one of these uh, carbon block filters in line here after your granulated carbon filter, you can install a one micron sediment filter and that'll catch all of that dust before it goes into the system. So let's quickly talk about system design. Now conventionally a lot of you guys would have seen uh, these filter systems where there's three filters in a row, uh, they generally all be the same size. I'm just using this one to show you guys what I mean. Um, I don't have another big one on hand, but generally you would see three of these filters in a row and then uh, after the last filter it would travel down into the UV sterilizer and then out into the rest of your system. Uh, but clearly you can see that I've gone for a different setup, a split setup, and we'll talk about that right now. So. Conventionally, uh, with our three filter setup, you'll have your sediment filter as the first stage, a carbon filter as the second stage, and then a, a sediment filter again as a third stage. Uh, this last sediment filter generally being a one micron filter, so it's filtering out really, really small stuff. And then after that, it goes into the UV tube so that the UV sterilizer can actually do what it's supposed to do effectively, is uh, you know inactivate the bacteria or kill the bacteria. But what can happen in, in this type of a setup, um, carbon filters are a breeding ground for bacteria. So uh, what ends up happening is over time, if you've got a lot of bacteria in your water, then this carbon filter is that um, breeding ground and this carbon filter can get saturated with uh, bacteria, if you will. <laughs> and you can end up with a scenario where your water coming into the carbon filter has actually got less bacteria than the water coming out of the carbon filter uh, because it's this breeding ground for bacteria. Um, so what ends up happening then uh, in the beginning, in the early stages, not too much of a problem, but you can have this overwhelming amount of bacteria coming through the third stage of filtration and then again this overwhelming amount of bacteria flowing into our UV sterilizer. And the sterilizer is actually overwhelmed if you, you know, sort of want to explain it that way. And uh, it can't actually sterilize or inactivate all of the bacteria traveling through it. So um, basically it doesn't do its job properly. I think uh, you could probably get into a scenario where there's so much bacteria that some of the bacteria shades the other bacteria and that's how it passes through the system. Um, and you've got to keep in mind that, of course, as the system ages, the intensity of the UV light reduces and also, as the system ages, the, the breeding ground or, or the saturation in your carbon filter increases. So both of these are kind of working together to make the situation a lot worse. Um, so what I've got here is the split system uh, where we've got our sediment filters first, removing or clearing out the um, sort of the, the water, the, sus the suspended particles in the water. Again, remember, this is a one micron sediment filter here. Um, then it travels through our UV sterilizer. So we don't have any breeding ground of bacteria over here. Then what happens is as it travels through our UV sterilizer, um, the sterilizer inactivates or kills all the bacteria. So you've only got inactive bacteria traveling through and into our carbon filters. So um, the carbon filters are no longer a breeding ground for bacteria because it's been inactivated already. Um, so basically then uh, the carbon filters do, as I've mentioned before, what they do. And then you've traveled out and you've got sterilized water traveling out into the rest of your system. So that's why I've gone with this design. Now, uh, are there any drawbacks? Well, yes, there are some drawbacks. Um, if you're for whatever reason, if you have load shedding as we do in South Africa, or if your UV sterilizer loses power for whatever reason, then you're going to have uh, unfiltered water traveling through into your, um, into your carbon filters. 
So you'll have basically your UV sterilizer is, <laughs> is the break between uh, water with bacteria and water with out bacteria. So you can have this cross-contamination happening where you've got water with bacteria traveling all through the system and then eventually the bacteria travels into your carbon filters. Remember it's a breeding ground and then the bacteria ends up growing in your carbon filters um, and then for whatever reason obviously your, you, you find the problem, your power is restored, now your UV light is back to doing what it was originally doing, sterilizing the water but now it's already let, um, it's already let bacteria into your carbon filters and then it grows like that. So that is one of the drawbacks of the system um, designed like it is but yeah you know it's just one of those things that you've got to keep in mind. We are lucky enough here that I've got this uh, this UV sterilizer powered 100% of the time. It's powered uh, via a battery backup system so that that will never happen. Um, I've heard some people saying well this is maybe not a good idea because what happens if this, uh, the, the water coming through here, yeah, once it travels through our UV sterilizer, uh, what happens if the UV sterilizer doesn't kill all of the bacteria and then it ends up traveling into our carbon filters and, and becomes a breeding ground there? And my answer, to, you know, and, and they say it's better to do it the other way with a conventional setup where you've got the three filters and then you've got your UV sterilizer as the very last stage of filtration. And my answer to that is, well, if you're saying whatever happens before the UV serializer when the conventional system when there's three filters here uh, if you're saying well the, the, the UV light will take care of all of that and it won't let any bacteria through well then by that same token so long as this light stays on in this type of system the UV light is not going to let any bacteria through anyway <laughs> so it's much of the same argument um, I've talked to a few people about this uh, about this type of design and uh, I'm not just talking about random people, like people that have studied water and water design and reverse osmosis systems. And um, they've said there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. And my water test results can actually prove that. So that's the reason why I've gone with this split setup. Now, um, again, just something to remember for you guys doing your installation, every installation is gonna be different. Um, it, it may require different, uh, different stages of filtration or slightly different um, arrangements, but this is just what I've gone for and it's working for us. Oh yeah, and I nearly forgot, there's something that I also wanted to comment on, is uh, if you've got uh, water that is, is quite heavily laden with bacteria, there are scenarios or arrangements that you can do to recirculate your water so that your water actually passes through the UV sterilizer multiple times um, in case it doesn't sort of inactivate all the bacteria the first time around. There are these sort of system designs available. I've seen them sometimes uh, in, in systems that are designed around reverse osmosis. Uh, we're not gonna cover that in too much detail actually in this video, but it's also again something to keep in mind that you can actually recirculate, uh, recirculate your water to get the most effective, uh, I don't know, <laughs> inactivation of bacteria, if you will. So when it comes to choosing your filters, how do you know which filters to choose? Well, um, there's two different size filters that I've got here. These are a 20 inch by two and a half inch. Now you also get a 20 inch, which is the same length, by a four and a half inch filter, which is it's quite a lot fatter than this. And then you also get a, a 10 inch filter. So the, this is a 10 by two and a half inch. You can see it's quite thin or narrow and you also get a 10 by a four and a half inch which is a nice fat short filter. So we'll talk about that uh, shortly but that's all going to come down to what is your flow rate that you require and uh, what are your water conditions like um, but we'll talk about that shortly. Some of the other things to consider when choosing your filter is to make sure that your, your filter housings have got these bleed nipples on the top here to bleed air out the system. Uh, some of the filters don't, they, they don't actually come with these things. Now I've got a perfect example where this one has got a little red button on the top here and you push that in and then the air can come out the system and it bleeds it nicely. So we've got one of them over here. But this one, you can't really see it from where you are, but this, this filter cap didn't have one. Um, it was just a blank filter cap. I ended up drilling and putting in a stainless steel screw in the top here to bleed the water out. So just keep that in mind when you are choosing your brand or the type of filter. Uh, also, what is going to be of consideration is the inlet and the outlet um, pipe sizing or connection. So these come in generally three sizes. They are half inch, three quarter or a one inch size. This is the uh, three quarter inch size for 
the size piping that I'm using. Again, depending on your flow rate um, and your requirements there. If, of course, if you have the bigger filters, generally those have bigger inlets and outlets to accommodate, to accommodate sort of, you know, faster or a greater flow of water. So what size filter are you guys gonna need? Well, it's gonna depend on your flow rate and uh, the conditions of your water. So in our case, we are collecting rainwater. It's pretty clean water, not a lot of sediment in it. Um, so something like a 20 inch by a two and a half inch filter is gonna be fine. Um, it's not gonna clog up very quickly. So it'll, it'll probably give us a good six months to a year before it starts blocking up. Also, um, this is more economical to replace this filter element than the bigger ones. However, if you are using water that is really dirty, it's got a lot of sediment in it, um, these smaller filters will block up a lot more quickly. So then it's going to be better to use maybe a 20 by 4.5 inch filter. It's got a much greater surface area, so, we'll, so your flow rate uh, will be able to be maintained for a much longer period of time. Um, also, I've heard of some people saying, well, I'll just install a bigger one and replace the elements every two or three years. And uh, I mean, look, I, I suppose, guys, that is up to you, whatever you want to do. But my personal opinion is I would rather change a filter more often. So once every a cheaper filter, uh, once every six months or a year, because then whatever buildup is in here does not get carried through your system. Um, and you've just got fresh filters more often rather than this dirty, dingy filter being in there and your water is being filtered through that, you know, for two or three years. So something else to keep in mind when choosing the size of your filters, of course, is your flow rate. Now I'll give you two examples. If you've got a large household, maybe every room has got an ensuite bathroom and there's a large number of people likely going to use water all at the same time, you're gonna be better off going with a, a larger filter, like a 20 inch by a four and a half inch filter so that you've got sufficient flow rate. If you've got a small household um, and maybe the people are only gonna be using water sequentially, so like one after the other, then uh, your flow requirements are a lot less. And I've seen it quite often where these smaller filters, the 20, uh, sorry, the uh, 10 by two and a half inch filters are sufficient or even the 10 by four and a half inch filters, uh, they, they give you enough flow rate. So something else to keep in mind is that the flow rate decreases as the filter ages, or should I say, as the filter blocks up. And I think it goes without saying that these smaller filters will block up a lot more quickly than the larger filters. Which brings us to the question, when do we need to service the system or how do we know when our filters need to be changed? So as I mentioned previously, I think it's good practice to at least change them once a year. You don't want um, this buildup of unwanted material and matter in your filters. You want to be changing that out quite regularly. But maybe um, you have a drop in pressure, so you open your tap and then you're noticing the pressure is actually really low and you're wondering, hmm, I wonder if my pump is starting to give up. Well, uh, maybe start off with your filters. Uh, they are probably starting to block up. So you might have a, a high pressure on the inlet before your first filter and a much lower pressure after the last or the fourth filter in our case here on the outlet. And that is kind of a, an indication that these filters are starting to block up. And I have seen this multiple, multiple times where I get a phone call and the guy says, uh, or the girl <laughs> says, Grant, I think there's something wrong with my pump. It can't be, I mean, this pump is, is brand new. It's a couple of months old. And I open the tap and nothing's happening. What's, what's up here? And, and literally I get there, open up the filter and it is caked brown. It looks like solid, solid mud. And that filter clearly is blocked and needs to be changed. And literally within a few minutes, we just take that one out, rinse out the system, put a new filter element in, screw it back up and everything is working just as, as normal. Um, but <laughs> when you are using your system, it doesn't just happen like that overnight. And as I said, if you're noticing a drop in pressure as you're opening your taps, it's not quite what you're used to. That's an indication that likely you need to maybe uh, service your filters. So now that you've realized that you need to service or change out the filters in your uh, filtration system, how do we do that? Well, uh, in a lot of installations, uh, people will install an isolating or a ball valve before the first stage of filtration and after the, the last stage of filtration on the outlet side so that they can easily shut off both of those valves and they can service the system pretty easily. They might even have a bypass line where they can bypass water um, through to the house so that there's no disruption of uh, water flow. But in most cases in a residential property, and to disrupt the water flow for half an hour is not really a problem. However, you can see my design is <laughs> somewhat different and it's because of the way things are arranged here. Um, I don't have 
an isolating valve on this part of the line. So what uh, I will always do in this case, because I've got a strainer down here, I've got a strainer between our pump and our pump controller that also needs to be serviced and cleaned. I'm going to um, close the isolating valve over here that is between the pump and the pump controller. So I'll close that valve. And then I'm also going to close the main inlet water line that comes into our controller quite simply by shutting the valve there. And then on the outlet side of, uh, you know, after our last stage of filtration, remember my shuttle valve is over here, I will close that valve. Now, the water part of the installation is completely isolated and I can open everything and service it. But before I do, uh, it's very important uh, and I prefer to do it this way, uh, we need to take care of the electricity side of things. And remember earlier when I talked about the reason and how I've installed the electricity in the outlets over there in the waterproof boxes. So uh, when it comes to install or when it comes to servicing the system, I can literally go there, lift up the lid and unplug the plug from the electrical outlet. So the electricity to this part of the system is completely isolated and there's no chance of electrical shock. And that is something guys really don't underestimate that. Um, <laughs> you don't want to be in the scenario where you're working on water and you think, ah, oh, this is actually quite easy, and then eventually you get electrocuted. That's really not what you want to do. So here's a top tip uh, when it comes to opening these filter housings. I know sometimes a lot of people might battle to open them. And uh, now you do get a filter spanner. It's like a sort of a plastic spanner. You slide onto the bottom of the housing here, and you can, you can open it or untighten it like that. Uh, but even with that spanner, these can be really, really, really tight. And the reason for that is because there's still pressure in the system. Now, um, these filters, here's a spare filter that I've got. Uh, these things have got really big threads and it's a tapered uh, type of sort of uh, connection. So when you tighten this up nice and tight so that it's not leaking, then you open it, this whole lot is under a lot of pressure and it's basically forcing um, the filter housing away from the cap. And there's a lot of friction created here in these threads. So how do we get rid of that friction? Well, we just release the pressure from the system and literally it is that simple and it's overlooked so many times. So we can either use the bleed screw to just press it down and bleed some of the, the, um, the water pressure out. Sometimes that doesn't work and you might have to go to a tap down the line and just open that tap to let the pressure out of the system. And once the pressure is out, you'll, you should be able to take your hands and then loosen your filter housing. <laughs> so don't get caught out like that. So now that you've changed the filter elements in your filter housings, don't forget that the UV sterilizer also needs to be serviced at least once a year. So generally speaking here, the lamp uh, inside the sterilizer needs to be replaced once a year. Um, now I've heard of people saying, yeah, but my lamp is still working after one year. But you need to realize that the intensity of the lamp decreases as time goes by. So generally, these types of systems with these types of lamps are rated for about 8,000 hours um, of use. And then the lamp needs to be replaced. And that is roughly about a year, maybe slightly less than a year, but a year is fine. Um, also, something to keep in mind is when you take out and replace the UV lamp, there's also a quartz glass tube inside here. You want to take that glass tube out and you want to clean it generally with cleaning alcohol you want to make sure that that glass tube is really really clean so that the UVC rays can pass through it without without being hindered and then your system uh, should be good enough uh, to work for another year now it is quite important that you don't uh, break any part of the system I mean it's glass that you're dealing with here and if you're not sure how to uh, install this or if you're not sure how to take it apart just go check on the previous video where I show you guys how I installed this entire system and you'll see how I installed the quartz tube and uh, the UV lamp in this UV sterilizer so basically when it comes to servicing you'll do the opposite to remove it clean it and then put it back into service so why did I mount my pump controller separate to my pressure pump? Now conventionally, you've got your uh, water pump or your pressure pump over here and the controller is mounted directly onto the outlet on top of the pressure pump. Now in my case, it was done for two reasons. Basically, um, for this Davy rain bank in the instructions, it recommended that between your pressure pump and the controller that you have a screen filter of about 200 microns. So I didn't really want the screen filter sort of being mounted tall up here and then it's kind of sitting right up here um, the 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 control switch here or the flow controller so 
That's one of the reasons. And the other reason is that because of this type of setup where we've got our tank inlet water coming over here and we've got our main inlet water coming out and into the controller over there, it was just much simpler for me to uh, mount it on the wall and all of our pipes are parallel and mounted on the wall. I suppose you could also um, say there's a third uh, example or maybe 2.5. <laughs> Sometimes I work on these pumps and um, I've got two quick couplings and I mentioned it before in the video. There's one over there and there is one over there. So uh, it's easy for me to just unscrew those two and remove the pump and put another pump into place and test that. Uh, now imagine how difficult that would be or how, how much work, extra work it would be if the pump control and everything was mounted on top here. So that just works for me, but uh, your guys' case might be slightly different. I recommend do whatever works best for your setup. So why does it look like I've mounted our UV sterilizer upside down with the inlet and the outlet facing up? Uh, compared to the more conventional way of doing it where people mount it either vertically up like that, or you'll see often they're mounted horizontally above the filters. And there's a very simple reason for that, and that is to be able to bleed the air out of the system. So uh, keep this in mind that when you've serviced your entire system and for the system then to operate uh, efficiently and, and smoothly, you need to bleed air out of the entire system. So everything fills up with water, and where does air go? It wants to go up to the highest point. And if you have a look at these types of um, housings, they don't have any way to bleed the air out of the system. So if this uh, housing here, this um, UV sterilizer was right at the top of our system, of course the air is gonna collect in that and there's no way to bleed the air out. So we put it down here with the filter or with the outlet and the inlet facing up. So any air in the system will naturally migrate to the top of the filters and what do we have at the top of each filter housing? Well, we've got a little bleed nipple over there and we've got a, in this one, we've got a screw that we can take out and then we can easily bleed out all of the air out the system and then it's gonna work really efficiently. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, when you do uh, mount them, mount these UV sterilizers up here horizontally or even vertically, uh, they do still work but I just prefer to do it this way. So another question that I've been asked is why did I go to all of the expense of using copper pipe everywhere here in the system and then why did I just go ahead and use a piece of plastic or, or multi-layer pipe here and then feeding into our main water line? Well, it's actually quite simple. This outlet setup is actually gonna change a little bit and at a later stage, it's gonna come out here, it's gonna go down, and it's also potentially gonna go up the wall into another part of the property. So until we've got that finalized, I'm using a piece of uh, this multi-layer or PEX pipe. I've only got one more piece of copper, and as you guys know, copper pipe is really expensive, and I didn't wanna waste it and cut the wrong length until uh, I know exactly what is gonna happen. So that is really the only reason why I've used this piece of PEX pipe over here. So why did I end up choosing 22 millimeter copper pipe? Because it is really expensive and there are cheaper alternatives on the market. Well, there's basically two reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that uh, I wanted to use copper pipe leading into and out of the, uh, the UV sterilizer because UV light can degrade or weaken the plastic over time. Um, so that's why I've gone for the copper leading directly into and out of that sterilizer. But the other uh, more important factor is the flow rate that we require. So most people might think, okay, well, not a problem. I'll use multi-layer pipe. I'll use a piece of 22 millimeter multi-layer pipe, but then you've got to use an insert um, on the end of each multi-layer pipe. And if you have a close look here, look how small the hole is in that insert. The hole in this insert for 22 millimeter uh, multi-layer pipe is actually smaller than the whole size of 15 millimeter copper. So you will actually get a better flow rate through 15 millimeter copper than what you will get through 22 millimeter PEX pipe or multi-layer pipe. And I needed the most flow rate that I could get so uh, even though it was more expensive I went with 22 millimeter copper. Now this is poly copper, it's like a plastic version of copper pipe. I just put this here for an example, but the copper pipe's uh, internal diameter, the whole size is about that big. Um, so you can see it's quite a lot, whoopsie. Uh, it's quite a lot larger than the equivalent size in the PEX pipe. So let me try and get these, everything's falling off here. But 22 millimeter um, multi-layer pipe with the insert would be there and 22 millimeter copper pipe would be there. 
that is a huge difference and much greater flow rate through the, through the copper pipe. So another question I often get asked is, why do I spend extra money buying stainless steel filter mounting brackets when you normally buy these filters and they come with a powder coated uh, steel bracket? I mean, why do you need it? It's powder coated, it's painted already, it's not gonna rust. Well, let me tell you again, I've done a whole lot of these installations, new installations and refreshed some old installations. And every single time I've seen an old installation with a powder coated uh, steel bracket at the coast, they are all rusted after a couple of years. So when I do installations, I prefer to just spend a little bit of extra money and buy stainless steel mounting brackets. And I use stainless steel mounting hardware, basically on the brackets, on any screws. I mean, you've seen me using it all over the place here. Um, relative to the cost of the system, the additional cost of using stainless steel nailing anchors and brackets is such a small cost and it goes such a long way uh, to making your system last for many, many, many years. So now that you've serviced your entire system and replaced all the filters and cleaned out everything, you need to put the system back into operation. So you might think this is as simple as just whacking open the valves and then everything will work as intended. Now, maybe this has worked for you in the past, but it's not the correct way to do things. You want the water to bleed slowly through the system so that uh, you don't collapse any of the filters and you don't have any sort of hydro hammering happening throughout your system. So I would recommend that uh, when you do change your filters, uh, now again, this is just a small filter housing for demonstration purposes. I know the plastic is still on this filter, but um, this is, for example, a carbon block filter. Um, so we take our housing, we can pop the carbon block filter into the housing, and then we'll fill this with water. We'll pre-fill it with water, and then we can screw that into, into the housing head. So we'll do this with all the filters. It works a lot better with these carbon filters than it does with the sediment filters. The sediment filters tend to float. So if you are having trouble uh, maybe just put a little bit of water in or don't worry too much about the sediment filters, but definitely with the carbon filters, pre-fill them. And then uh, when it comes to actually opening the valves, don't go and whack them open. Um, what you want to do is slowly open the valve on the, on the sort of the, the inlet side of the first uh, sediment filter. Really slowly open it, just crack it open. You'll hear the water kind of starting to trickle in and you let the water slowly trickle in, slowly fill through the, through the filter and then it'll top over onto the next filter. And it'll slowly top over through your system and you'll, you can actually put your ear next to it and you can actually hear it starting to fill in most cases. Um, and then once everything is full, you'll, you'll see the water maybe starting to come out here uh, out of your bleed, little bleed valve. Uh, now, as I've mentioned before, I've got the push button one here and I've got an actual screw that you take out here and you can see the water squirting out. Um, so once all of these are full and you've got water on the outside of the filter and the inside of the filter, then you can go ahead and open that, um, open that valve completely. Now, what happens uh, when you whack the valve open, your pump says, <laughs> sure, okay, I'm gonna give you pressure. And if you've got a big pump, five, six bars of pressure, no problem. Big flow, and you can actually end up collapsing these filters. So just something to keep in mind now, there's probably other ways and methods to do this, but that's just uh, one of the methods that I've found that works fairly well. And after turning your entire system back on, and once your water is flowing again, also, and especially after you've replaced uh, the carbon block and carbon granulated carbon filters, um, you wanna let the water flow for a couple of minutes so that any powder or residue or particles that these new filters are gonna give off are kind of flushed through the system and away. Um, and I've, I've actually seen it sometimes where the water can actually be like a, have a black tint to it or a white tint to it, depending on the brand and the type of filters that you've used. Um, so, so don't be scared if you do see that, just let the water run for about five minutes and then you should be good to go. So I guess now it's time for you guys to have a little bit of a chuckle. And that has got to do with our water pump covers. Now, uh, of course, this doesn't look very nice at all. This is just an old storage container that has a cutout in it to cover the motor and an old ice cream container to put over the pump controller. Very temporary, definitely. Uh, but this is something that you guys don't want to skimp on. Um, you, you're going to make these or, or spend a lot of money doing these, these elaborate installations on expensive equipment. 
and then it's going to stand out in the sun and the rain. And what you do is you just go out and you buy yourself um, a purpose-made pump cover. <laughs> Look, you can do the whole storage box thing if you want to. Um, I haven't bought myself a purpose-made pump cover yet, but I will, uh, just to round off the installation. Uh, but it's very important to cover all of your equipment to keep it out of the sun and rain. And then it's, uh, you know, that way it just lasts a whole lot longer. You might also want to consider doing it with these filters. Um, now, I haven't really seen uh, covers that, that are made for these filter arrangements because they can be arranged in so many different ways. But I think at a later stage, I'm probably going to make a little sort of a clip-on filter here, uh, or clip-on filter cover, should I say, or that'll clip on and it'll hang over our filters. So it'll keep these out of the sun, so there'll be no uh, degradation of the plastic over time. And uh, yeah, I reckon that'll just make the, the system last a little bit longer. <laughs> so here's a question that I've had, and maybe you guys have also had this question, but after we've completed our installation of the UV sterilizer, we assume that it's gonna continue working at least for the next year. Now, if you look at the ballast, uh, we do have a little work light and a fault light, but in my case, it's outside and in a lot of your guys' cases, it's not gonna be in your face all the time. So how do you know that this thing is continually working? Now, these little things do have a small alarm built into them, a little buzzer, but what, realistically here, what are the chances of me hearing this buzzer outside? Or also in your cases, um, if you are in an off-grid setup, your pump and your filtration system is likely in a separate room, you're probably not gonna hear that. Now on some of the more expensive uh, UV sterilizers in the center here, they've got a little outlet and they've got a little monitoring device that looks into the UV light and it monitors sort of the intensity of the light and the clarity of the water. And if there's a problem, then it can be programmed to shut off on the inlet side over there. It can be programmed to shut off, say an electronic valve and then it cuts off the water and then you know, hang on, there's a problem. But in this case, with a lot of these uh, less expensive systems, they don't have that. So what I'm actually thinking about doing is working on a, a bit of a monitoring system that will monitor the work and the faults LEDs on our ballast. And if either of those, if the work LED goes out or maybe if the fault LED comes on, then that triggers some type of relay and it then triggers an electronic shutoff valve to shut off the water or to shut off the pump. We'll see which way it goes. Let me know in the comments what you guys think about uh, that example, or maybe there are other things on the market that I don't know about uh, that are reasonably priced. I'm not talking about hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of dollars here. Um, something that is reasonably priced that can be installed into the system that monitors it and that uh, we can know exactly what's happening all the time. Let me know, I always like to hear from you guys. Also, I haven't yet got around to installing the water level float switch. I definitely am still gonna install that, but not in this video. So after two weeks of use, I had one of the local labs test our water and to no surprise, it is perfectly safe for consumption. We tested the E. coli, total coliforms, heterotopic plate counts, and they are well, well within safe standards. It's also important to remember that every single installation is unique. Uh, it very much depends on the quality of your water source. So for example, is it rainwater or is it well water? So basically what I'm trying to say is that even though if you install the exact same system that I have installed, that doesn't guarantee that your guys' water is gonna be safe for consumption. It is always best practice to have your water tested and to check that your system is working effectively. So that said, I hope you guys found the video useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and leave us a comment. If you've installed one of these systems, tell us about your system and maybe if there's some more tips and tricks that you guys wanna share with everybody else, leave them down in the comment section. Or maybe you are still thinking about installing one of these systems, let us know what you guys have planned. Also, in an upcoming video, we can have a look at the granulated carbon filters versus the carbon block filters. I've got some old ones which we can cut open and have a look. And I also wanna share with you some more must-know tips and tricks about servicing these filter systems. Guys, thank you very much for watching. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Cheers.